Okay, welcome to Mr. Van Lowe's Portally Monetized Low Budget Science Channel. Today we're going to take a look at DP Physics Topic 1.2, Uncertainty and Error. That's right. Probably should have done that earlier. Okay, let's jump in. Your learning objectives here. Uh, by the end of this lesson, you will be able to define and explain random and systematic errors absolute fractional and percentage uncertainties, and error bars. And I'm gonna turn off my air conditioning here just to make it a little quieter in the room. So if I sound sweaty, now you know why. All right, uh, so let's take a look. So when you make a measurement, your measurement is going to have uh, absolute uncertainty and both random and systematic error. And ideally, we want all of these to be as small as possible, ideally. So uh, your measuring devices will be limited by the smallest measurement that they can make. And some examples of those smallest measurements would be, for example, a ruler. Uh, the smallest measurement most rulers can make is one millimeter. Uh, if you're using a metric ruler, which, let's face it, you should be. Uh, a digital scale, the digital scales we have in my high school uh, have an accuracy of 0 0.1 grams. Okay, so that is the smallest measurement that my scales can make. Uh, obviously, you can get uh, much better scales, um, just like you can get a better ruler. Another example would be a burette. Um, Again, burettes typically measure about 0 0.1 centimeters cubed. That's the smallest measurement that they can make. Uh, although again, you can get more sensitive uh, burettes and pipettes and, and such. Okay, so there we have some examples. One thing uh, I see a lot is students trying to put these kind of adjectives on error. Like I have a small amount of error, a large amount of error. Well, it's all relative, right? So a small amount of error for your experiment might be an enormous amount of error for another experiment. For example, the uh, particle collider at CERN um, has very, very, very small error. So, um, we don't describe it as good or bad, just describe it as quantitatively, okay? So just give a number, and by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to do that. Where error becomes a problem is where your error bars uh, or random error are so large that you can't draw a conclusion from the data that you collect. There's no visible trend. Um, your trend line or curve doesn't really fit your data points. Okay, so that's that's when it becomes a problem. It means your data is inconclusive. Okay, and if that happens, then you need to try to decrease your uh, uncertainty or your error. And usually the error we're talking about there is random, which we'll define it in a moment. But first, let's look at absolute uncertainty. So this is going to depend on the type of measuring device. So if you have a digital device, uh, your absolute uncertainty will be plus or minus the smallest possible measurement. So the example we used earlier, a digital scale, will have an uncertainty of plus or minus 0 0.1 grams. Uh, so an example of a measurement that we might get off of a digital scale then would be 10.2 plus or minus 0 0.1 grams. Uh, and as you can see, the number of decimal places on my measurement, 10.2, uh, matches the number of decimal places of my uncertainty. So we have one decimal place there. All right, for an analog device, our measurement will be plus minus one half the smallest possible measurement. So going back to my ruler, uh, the example here is going to be plus minus 0 0.5 millimeters. Okay, so we take half of the smallest increment, uh, one millimeter. So an example of a measurement here would be uh, 15.6 plus minus 0 0.5 grams. Oops, that's a mistake. That should be millimeters. Look at the professionalism. 
Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so you should note that your last decimal place for an analog device can be visually estimated, and we don't have the ability to do this with digital instruments. Okay, and that gives us a, a little bit uh, better uh, estimate. Okay, so what I would like you to do is estimate the length of this pencil with uncertainty and go ahead and give your answer in centimeters just for fun. So just look at the length of the pencil and go ahead and estimate how long you think this pencil is. And you should pause the video now and do that while I quietly hum the Jeopardy theme tune to myself. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. All right, uh, so <clears throat> The absolute uncertainty, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, the answer to this question is 5.43 plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters, okay? And you'll note that this red dotted line here shows uh, where we get that 5.43. So we count this off one, two, three, four tenths of a centimeter, and then we can estimate that final digit. Um, and it looks like it's about 0 0.03, roughly, okay, centimeters. All right, so that means that our answer then in total, again, 5.43 plus or minus 0 0.05 centimeters. And this estimate uh, is just your best guess. We know from the uncertainty that it could be anywhere, basically between this point and this point, or you get the idea. All right, uh, digital measurements, we cannot make an estimate. We can only read the digital uh, screen, right? The LCD screen, usually. So let's talk about accuracy versus precision. So accuracy is how close a measurement is to the actual value being measured, and accurate measurements will have low systematic error. Precision, uh, is given by the consistency of multiple measurements. So measurements that are very precise have low random error. And it's not unusual to see this, uh, these exemplified by targets. So you can imagine uh, throwing darts at this target or shooting it or whatever. Uh, in our first example here, we have accuracy that are clustered around the center, but they're not close to the center. So we're not precise, okay? Here we have precision. Uh, in other words, we're making the same mistakes over and over and over again, but not accuracy, okay? It's not close to the center of the target. In this example, we have both precision and accuracy, and if you're throwing darts or shooting, this is ideally what you want, right? And our last one is the worst possible outcome. We're neither precise nor accurate. Um, so there you go. Next, we're going to talk about systematic error. So this occurs when a measurement is consistently skewed either too large or too small. So every measurement taken uh, where you have systematic error is going to be one of those two things, too large, too small. So an example of this would be where you fail to zero a digital scale uh, before taking a measurement. All of your measurements are going to be off by a certain amount. And poor calibration of a digital instrument is a common source of systematic error. So it's important that you think about that if you're using a digital instrument and considering whether or not you need to calibrate it. Uh, a measuring tape or ruler becomes stretched out over time, uh, probably more common with measuring tapes. And this is going to produce measurements that are consistently too small. So there's another example of systematic error. Finally, this last one, very common, uh, parallax error is where your eyeballs or a camera are not perpendicular to the instrument or object, such as a burette. Um, if you're doing video analysis, this is also a bit of an issue, potentially. Okay, so here we see a graph here. And uh, if you're looking for a systematic error in data, um, a good indicator of systematic error 
is when your line of best fit does not go through the origin of the graph. So here uh, we see our red line, and this is our theoretical line of best fit. That goes straight through the origin, right? But our blue line of best fit is from collected data. And as you can see, that has a y-intercept that is not equal to zero. Okay, so that y-intercept uh, tells us the amount of systematic error we have in the system. So a real data set is never going to go exactly through the origin. Um, I mean, it, it could, but it's very unlikely, okay? Uh, never is never is not a great word. Uh, you could have, you know, there could be a fluke where it actually does go through, but um, it's going to be very rare. Okay, so random error is a fluctuation in a measurement. So sensitive digital instruments uh, are really good at showing lots of random error, uh, but it can occur with either a digital or analog measurement. So. Uh, a classic example of this is a multimeter um, where you're taking a reading from a battery or you're measuring current um, and it's fluctuating. It's not staying consistent. And this, is, this is not at all unusual. Um, different example with an analog device could be a thermometer showing slightly different temperatures for different trials um, in a lab and that would be due to changing air temperature in the lab. Um, yeah, your fluctuating multimeter, probably due to random electromagnetic activity. We're constantly surrounded by uh, radio waves and other stuff, and so um, that affects your measurement. Okay, another example might be a video analysis of trolley rolling down a ramp. Um, and you'll see that the trolley between trials will take different paths and maybe have different velocities slightly different velocities for different trails. And this is just due to uh, the complex surface that your ramp is rolling, um, your trolley is rolling down. So there you go. <clears throat> OK. Um, so when you're talking about analyzing your data, and especially considering improvements to an experiment, uh, what you want to think about is sources of random and systematic error. And students always say, a good way to improve a data set is to improve the sensibility of measuring instruments. And this is not wrong, but here's what your teacher thinks. You're not wrong, but this is true for literally every science experiment ever. So you get a C minus. Um, you're, you're not wrong, but uh, this, is, this is like the minimum, the bare minimum. You've barely thought about your experiment. Uh, you want to think about specific improvements, not random, uh, not random improvements. And there's my phone, which is going off right now. Okay, so in order to successfully identify sources of error, you need to take notes and make observations um, while you're conducting your experiment. You have to do this. Um, the next thing is you really have to understand the theory involved in the experiment, okay? Um, if you don't do both of these things, you're not really going to identify a uh, good source of sources of error, prob probably, okay? Oh, I forgot to animate this slide. Well, we're just going to power through. I was worried about that. Um, calculating an average, you guys all know how to calculate averages, I, I hope. Um, basically, you take each data point from different trials. And if you have n data points, then you divide by that integer, uh, n. Okay. Okay, phone's really blown up. I need to turn that down. There we go. Uh, so, n is the number of measurements taken. The values in the numerator are individual measurements. Yes, yes. And that means that, uh, sorry, we should not have more decimal places in your average than not get my phone to mute. There we go. Uh, that means that the mean should not have more decimal places than the least accurate measurement. Okay, so we're talking about significant figures here. Um, so go ahead and review topic 1.1 if you if you need a little refresher there. Um, sometimes people play around with that a little bit, and uh, there may be some exceptions to that rule. Anyway, uh, we have two possible approaches here to talking about the uncertainty of averages or means. 
First is standard deviation. Uh, second is procedural uncertainty. Standard deviation isn't examined, and uh, also it's not very useful when propagating uncertainty. So I kind of ignore standard deviation. If you want to use it, it's fine, but I'm not going to go through it here. Um, your average values typically are going to be processed uh, further, and that is why propagating uncertainty um, is required, and your procedural uncertainty is going to be more useful. So. Procedural uncertainty is given by the maximum value, the largest measurement, minus the smallest measurement, which is then divided by two. Okay, uh, so just to express it as an equation, uh, procedural uncertainty, which we're calling here delta x, is equal to x max minus x min divided by two. Okay, there, math up. Okay, uh, uncertainties are going to have one significant figure unless the first digit of the uncertainty is one. And this actually happens uh, more often than you would think. It happens about 30% of the time, so quite often. Uh, so if that happens, uh, your measurement is going to have two significant figures. Uh, so we'll do a quick example here. Go ahead and calculate the mean and uncertainty of the following measurements. So these are measurements of length given in meters. And I will just pause it while you calculate it and hum the Thep Jeopardy theme song to myself. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, okay, that's enough. All right, so the mean calculated here is 1.4483333 meters. So this three is just continuing off into infinity. Uh, our uncertainty is plus or minus 0 0.17 meters. And because this is a one, uh, our uncertainty in this case can actually have two uh, sig figs. So our reported value then is going to be 1.45 plus or minus 0 0.17 meters, okay? We again round off our mean to the number of significant figures that our uncertainty has. Um, this will be one, uh, one sig fig more often than not, but also, again, if this is a one, you can use two sig figs. Okay, there you go. So fractional and percentage uncertainty uh, is given by dividing the absolute uncertainty by the actual measurement taken. So now we're talking about fractional uncertainty. So uh, this is an example measurement. Uh, so a is equal to a sub zero plus or minus delta a. Okay, so let's define these. So a is our reported measurement. So a includes both the measurement itself and uncertainty. So a sub zero is our estimate or mean and delta a is absolute or procedural uncertainty. And you'll note here that I have, I have two conditions. Um, so if you're using means or averages, uh, you would use procedural uncertainty. If you're doing an actual measurement, you do the estimate and the absolute uncertainty. Okay, so our fractional uncertainty is just going to be given by taking uh, our absolute uncertainty or procedural uncertainty and dividing by the measurement, okay, or mean. Okay, so as, as I've already stated, this will work for both individual measurements or mean values. Okay, so you can apply it to one measurement or you can apply it to an average value that you would get out of a data table. Okay, so for a percentage uncertainty, we just take our fractional uncertainty and multiply that by 100. Pretty straightforward. And we're going to pause here because I will have to do another lecture for propagating uncertainty. So uh, catch that a little bit later. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. Uh, please do not like or subscribe to my channel uh, and have a great day.